and you certainly knew about it because you had the, the journey up here, up from the school, up Chapel Hill and onto the chapel itself, which is purposely built on this uh, commanding position. It was a gift by Sir Walter Morrison, who was the local MP for Skipton at the time, and also a governor of the school. And nothing has changed for those hundred years now. The chapel is exactly the same as it was a hundred years ago. One of the most moving services was the last night of term, and everyone used to come up here about half past nine, quarter to ten, and the whole chapel was in the dark, except for two candles on the altar. And this was a service in memory of those who had died in the war, when, of course, there was a blackout, and uh, services uh, were held in the dark in those days. So you had to learn everything off by heart. But it was the same music and the same hymns uh, every end of term. There was uh, Elgar, Nimrod, there was the London Derriere, there was Oh God, I Help in Ages Past, and so on. And uh, I guarantee it was a good job it was held in the dark, because even, even the 12 stone rugger buggers, the big tough guys who were leaving, well, there wasn't a dry eye in the house, and that included them. My father came here in the late 20s and he was always very keen that I should come here. So I went to a, a day prep school in Dingley till I was just 13 years and one month and came here in well, January of 1957. So he was uh, prepared to make a big sacrifice because frankly at that time the mill wasn't doing very well at all. There was really very little money so we really had to scrape and scrimp to send me. Although luckily I did get a scholarship. Having arrived here I got a scholarship. I think the vast sum of 100 and 35 pounds a year off the fees, which believe you me did help and it's funny sitting here in this all singing all dancing What is now a library, but this used to be the dining hall and uh, You just had to eat everything that was set in front of you There was no mamby pamming around if it was set in front of you. You jolly well had to eat it. I did uh, Perfect a device. I found a tin in the sanatorium where they used to keep uh, bandage tin and I used to bring this tin in and sit at a table and uh, when nobody's looking, I could discreetly scrape the food from, <laughs> put it in the tin and take it out of the, this room and empty it in the dustbin round the corner after lunch or after supper. So, yeah, I was a thin boy and hopeless at sport. I mean, really hopeless at sport. I have a school record here which I'm very proud of and I don't think it's ever going to be broken. And that is, I have a record of actually going a whole term, a whole term, 12 weeks, played rugby, Three times a week, 36 rugby games, I never touched the ball once. Never touched it. To see Richard Whiteley and Russell Harty, they were like Morecambe and Wise. They were just this wonderful double act uh, who were happy. They were just happy in the Yorkshire sunshine, drinking great wine, laughing and enjoying life. I wonder, Whiteley, if you're bothered at all to read the uh, title of this particular essay, which I took the liberty and pain of writing on this particular blackboard. What does it say? It says, account for Hamlet's delay, sir. And how do you think you've answered the question? Well, sir, there's ten pages, sir, and I've just... I am not discussing quantity, I'm talking about quality and the ability to actually get to the heart of a matter. Your concepts are rather hazy. I saw that film Dead Poets Society, and as I saw it, I couldn't believe it, because it was just so much like what happened here. It was the mid-50s, There was it was a boarding school, it was in the country, it was the staff were dyed in their ways and grey-haired and so on. And then this Robin Williams character came, just like Russell, and inspired all the boys to love English and love poetry and had a, built a great cult around him of energy and inspiration and love of, it, love of life and love of literature. And as I watched this film, I couldn't, because I didn't know what it was about until I saw it, I just couldn't believe it. I just thought that just like Russell Hart, the, in, the influence he had. If I hadn't gone to Giggleswick, I may not have gone on to Cambridge University and so on to ITN, and from there to Yorkshire TV. In fact, I know I owe the school a great debt of gratitude. wrote to Donald Baverstock, who was a great hero of the TV generation at the time, 
Uh, and uh, he interviewed me, and so did Ward Thomas, who was the, then the, the managing director. Uh, and w I remember Ward saying to Donald Baverstock, well, if you like him, I suppose he'll do. So I said, I'm on 1850. And there was a great silence. And I thought, oh, he knows, he knows I'm telling a lie. So Geoffrey Cox has told him. So then he said, oh, how's, how's, how's 2,500 a year sound? And I was so gobsmacked. I was so gobsmacked. Now it was my turn to be silent. Absolutely. So I couldn't believe it. I went dry-throated. 2,500 a year. And he thought I was playing silly buggers, really. And he said, OK, well, what about 2,600? <laughs> And I then had to say, yes, that'll be, thank you, that, that'll be fine. So uh, I left ITN and came to Yorkshire, and I arrived in Yorkshire uh, in the first week of April 1968. That's about three months before we went on the air. Working on calendar in the early days was huge fun. Yorkshire television hadn't been going very long, and there was a sense that we were breaking new boundaries, that every day we were doing something different. Uh, there was a lot of very talented people working on the programme, including Richard. And we felt we could do anything, and uh, it was it was a, a wonderful learning experience. We used to go out of our way to try and make Calendar not only a good news programme, but also a, an unmissable programme, and Richard was very much a part of that. The last time anything newsworthy happened in Bardney was, according to local experts, in the year 642. Every day during the summer, they come out and painstakingly go through <laughs> the clover patch to reap that day's harvest. Well, let's see how they're getting on today. And more, much more than this, I did it my... I just loved those years, those calendar years. Um, I very rarely took days off because I couldn't bear being at home and watching someone else do calendar. And ultimately, of course, I did leave calendar. Thanks very much. Right. OK. okay. Well, so come back and see us. It's all, been, it's all been a lot of fun. But we'll have more fun. The fun, the fun will go on. Yeah. In another place. We'll see you later. OK. Bye. I do regard those years of uh, being um, anchorman of calendar, and I was uh, the sole anchorman in those days, and then jointly with Jeff Druitt and then with Krista, um, as the best years of my life. And when I look back on this transient... All right. Medium that we do. We're here today, gone tomorrow. You, you do calendar, half past six, it's all finished. Although you, the best thing is a bit like sex, really. It's either been good or average or bad. Either way, it's all over. Hello, Richard. But if all goes well, you can do it again the next day. And that was the best thing about, about calendar. It was orgasmic. And I did end each day on a high. It was a, every, every day was a first night with calendar. A wonderful date. And you, Richard. Hello from the cliff top in Scarborough. To I'm speaking to you live. Well, I don't know if you've. You probably saw that, and it says it all. It says it all. The famous, the immortal ferret incident uh, will live in our hearts and minds forever. Ow, ow, ow! I'm sorry. Uh, uh, ow! The reason he's been seen in more countries than any other television personality in history is because of the ferret. It's all right, let it go. Put it on the floor. It won't hurt you. It is hurting me. Put it down. The ferret incident happened in 1977, which is a long time ago. If you just hold on to but uh, never to be forgotten. Up, it's made everyone laugh. It's made the whole world laugh. And uh, I know that will be my epitaph. I think when the Grim Reaper, Reaper arrives, it won't say, the, the obits won't say, perceptive TV interviewer dies, or popular parlour game afternoon TV host dies. <laughs> ferret man dies, because I'm known as a ferret man. Uh, I think everyone's seen that clip. It's one of the most famous clips in the world now. Thank you. If that had meant business, it would have been through to the bone. She's playing with you. Really? Yeah. Well, she can come around and play at it, time. <laughs> Countdown, in fact, is about numbers as well as letters, and we figure we've got a pretty good figure ruling that part of the game. Meet our vital statistician, Carol Vorderman. She's a Cambridge graduate and she works in computers. Happy no! birthday! All you have to do what? Choose some letters, put them in a row, and make a word from it. I mean, I could have thought of that. Feeble. <laughs>